very happy to uh, play host today to uh, IPIF and, and Dan um, on uh, I think what will be a very stimulating discussion and panel uh, about an issue that um, is now kind of bubbled to the top when you talk about uh, privacy and that's kind of the role of uh, self-regulatory uh, efforts and codes of conduct and you know against the backdrop of the uh, green paper that the administration recently put out. Um, you know, I think uh, it will be interesting couple of months to see how all this plays out. Um, you know, certainly, you know, speaking from the industry perspective, uh, there's some great things that can happen in allowing for innovation uh, using uh, uh, industry and the marketplace to, to drive things ahead. Of course, I see uh, Chris Calabrese in the, off, in the, in the audience. Um, just to call him out, uh, you know. So we've got to we've got to pay attention to reflected glory. Yeah. So we also have to balance that against the uh, interests of you know other stakeholders um, who are present consumers and, and other folks in this process. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to, to Daniel, and uh, we'll get started. But welcome, and if you have an opportunity, there's uh, great touch screen stuff that you can do, do over on that side of the office. And if you want to stay a little bit longer and play Connect, feel free. We've got a 150-inch screen with uh, Connect hooked up over to the right. Uh, stay as long as you want. I don't play it myself because the one time I started to play it, I stopped playing it, and it was about nine o'clock in the evening, and everybody had gone, and I had to notice. <laughs> but welcome. Thanks, Frank. Um, and I want to thank uh, Microsoft, especially for hosting us today. Uh, IKF's offices were fully booked. And it's uh, hard to find open space during the holiday season with all the holiday parties going on. Um, I'm Daniel Castro. I'm a senior analyst at the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. Um, it's kind of some background to this event. We, um, I, I think when you, you know, work in this area, you see that there's a lot of skepticism, or at least some skepticism, about uh, the effectiveness of self-regulation to govern online behavioral advertising. So we wanted to put together a, a panel discussion to really dive into this issue um, to look at what's going on right now, what the current practices are, and what um, what can be done in the future. And then concurrently, uh, current with this event, we're also releasing a report um, that really kind of looks at how self-regulation has been addressed in other industries. Um, that looks at kind of self-regulation at a high level, um, how it works, uh, and how it can apply to the internet and specifically to privacy um, in some areas. And I think when you, when you start looking at self-regulation, you, you realize that it's actually used in many different industries um, that have many of the same type of concerns that people have about privacy. So it's used in healthcare, it's used in uh, professional sports, it's used in fashion, it's used for nuclear energy. Um, it's used in a, a wide variety of areas. And at a conceptual level, um, there are many compelling reasons to use it in this space as well. So when you look at regulation, any kind of regulation, state or non-state, you see that there's many common characteristics, right? So all, all regulations have costs, and the, the point of a regulation is that it's supposed to provide some kind of societal benefit that outweighs these costs. And then, of course, along with regulation, you want to minimize the cost where all possible. Um, all regulation has the same types of processes. You, know, you have a, a rule-making, a rule-creating process, you have a monitoring mechanism, and you have an enforcement mechanism. Um, and there's a wide variety of regulatory options and a um, wide variety of ways that government and that the private sector are involved in each of these three different processes. So when you see the spectrum of regulation, on, on one end you have kind of pure uh, self-regulation or non-state regulation. So private market-based institutions that are using voluntary agreements, peer pressure, and other methods to coordinate uh, industry activities. Usually this occurs through a self-regulatory organization. Um, you know, examples of this are industry best practices or industry standards, professional codes of ethics, corporate social responsibility, self-policing activities, things like this. On the other end of the spectrum, of course, you have kind of the typical state-based regulation. You know, this is you know, typical legislation, maybe an executive order, administrative rulemaking. And then in the middle, you have a lot of this kind of fuzzy co-regulation area, um, where you have you know, industry and government jointly administering some kind of regulatory process. So you have government watchdog organizations that are providing oversight or some kind of enforcement. Um, you have government issuing recommendations or principles or codes of conduct and having um, soft law or kind of non-binding um, regulatory frameworks that are created. 
And then, of course, sometimes you don't have any regulation at all, right? So, but the absence of rules doesn't mean that uh, firms are engaging in bad behavior. Um, so there's many other controls that kind of fall outside this realm of regulation, including social norms, civil litigation, and market forces, including reputational harm, that all influence how uh, firms moderate their behavior. But again, so at a high level, you have many benefits of self-regulation. This is why we see this in, in many industries. Um, so what I want to do is talk about this at a little bit of a high level, and then we're going to turn over to the panel, and they're going to kind of dig down into how it works in practice in online behavioral advertising. Um, so you know, one of the main benefits is that it can be faster. Um, you can create rules faster uh, through a, a non-government process in many cases. Violations can be detected sooner. Uh, remediation can happen faster. Uh, those involved in creating the rules often have more expertise in this area than someone outside the industry. Uh, this means the rules can be more effective. Um, it can also internalize ethical behavior or certain principles so that it's the industry deciding this is what it wants to do as, as opposed to getting prescriptive rules of top-down outside reviews and trying to impose that on an industry. Um, it can be cheaper. Certainly minimizing compliance costs is one of the most compelling reasons that people right now in Washington, I think, are really thinking about how can we improve the regulatory process. The Small Business Administration recently uh, commissioned a report that found that the cost of regulation is exceeding $1.75 trillion on an annual basis, um, and it disproportionately falls on small businesses. Um, Self-regulation can be more flexible. It allows multiple paths for innovation. Um, government regulations especially can create barriers um, to market entry and to certain types of innovation, especially when they create rules that specifically address um, current business practices or current uh, market participants. Self-regulation could be less stringent. Um, it's more likely, for example, to use moving target regulations uh, that change over time and can adapt to new market conditions or, or change in social norms. Um, this flexibility means that self-regulatory organizations are more likely to be a little more experimental with the rules they create because they know if they're not effective, they can more easily take them away. Uh, Self-regulatory organizations are used to reduce information asymmetry. Uh, we see this even uh, you know, with the business, business, Better Business Bureau, that's a perfect example of it, where it provides more information to consumers. Um, they're able to um, have more consumer confidence in certain areas. We see this with other certification organizations, such as Underwriters Laboratory, uh, Trustee Certification for um, Online Privacy, or for mobile apps. And then self-regulation can be very effective for self-policing activities. Um, one reason it's more effective is because, in general, the private sector has more resources to do this. Um, how you can effectively do self-regulation is a difficult challenge for government because they don't always have um, you know, the right resources to do it. Second, government has this kind of principal agent problem. Um, in contrast, firms can exert um, a high degree of oversight because they see what's going on with their competitors and they can uh, let a self-regulatory organization know if they have a complaint about a certain activity. Uh, Self-regulation can avoid many of the jurisdictional issues or legal issues that you run into with uh, typical regulation. For example, um, you, know, you have jurisdictional issues with international types of regulations. You have uh, issues regarding free speech, for example, where you can't always impose regulations on, on certain actors because of First Amendment concerns. And then, of course, you can also um, try and avoid uh, conflicts of interest in these types of models by involving stakeholders that have competing business models or that have competing interests, even if they have similar business models. On the other side, there are certainly limitations to this. Um, Self-regulation can be very difficult, uh, especially in regards to some of the antitrust laws that are out there. Right? So you have to make sure that a self-regulatory organization avoids anti-competitive behavior. Uh, the Department of Justice brought in uh, antitrust suit against the uh, National Association of Realtors, for example, because of how they were handling the MLS listings, specifically restricting access to some internet brokers. Um, Self-regulatory organizations as an institution themselves have problems with uh, the free rider problem. You have a few companies or a few organizations that are willing to pay in to build this really effective self-regulatory self organization, um, but others you know, just kind of ride on the coattails of that without paying into it. Uh, sometimes self-regulation, of course, isn't a good choice, right? Um, for example, if a solution to a problem is very well known and not likely to change, it might be more effective, more efficient to do that through government regulation. Um, sometimes there's a, a high cost or high risk situation. Uh, certainly this is what we've seen with environmental regulations, where you have stringent regulations precisely to address these types of issues. Uh, for certain health-related 
uh, regulations, for example, uh, labeling of cigarette uh, packaging. This is uh, done, of course, to address more uh, specific personal health issues. And then, of course, if government doesn't either explicitly or implicitly endorse uh, self-regulation or any kind of regulation, it creates uncertainty. And that type of uncertainty can be a problem. Uh, but the, I think the real perception, especially in, in this area, is a, um, a perception issue. It's really seen as you know, putting uh, the fox in charge of the hen house. And getting around that perception issue is, I think, really one of the, the key challenges. And you know, it can be addressed in various ways. And that's, that's one of the issues that I'm hoping the panel will discuss. How do you, how do you get around that? Um, you know, one way is, of course, through designing uh, or creating well-designed institutions that avoid conflicts of interest. Another way is through uh, good oversight through the third party or through government. Um, but really, the goal here, I think, at the high level is uh, to emphasize that when we, when we talk about these types of issues, uh, for example, online behavioral advertising, you have to talk about not only what the rules are going to be, but what the process is to create the rules, and really look at that process and, and what the impact of that process is on the outcomes. Because the potential of overregulation is just as much as uh, it's just as much of a problem as the potential for underregulation in many of these areas. Uh, so, if you got the invitation to today's event, uh, you probably saw that there were going to be uh, five other panelists. Um, currently, I, I think we still have one who is arriving late, or she will be here. Um, Mike Zanis is fortunately um, out sick this morning, so he is not joining us. But we have still uh, five excellent panelists. Uh, Rachel Thomas, uh, who's the Vice President of Government Affairs, the Direct Marketing Association. Matt Stanton, who is the Vice President um, of Public Affairs and Corporate Social Responsibility at uh, Beam Global Spirits and Wine. Uh, Morgan Reed, who is the Executive Director of the Association for Competitive Technology. And uh, arriving shortly will be Jeannie Barton, um, who is with the Better Business Bureau and specifically with the Online Behavioral Advertising um, <laughs> Department. So what I'd like to do is first ask Rachel to kind of kick us off and talk specifically about um, you know, what's going on with uh, both how you've operationalized online behavioral advertising, self-regulation, and, and the kinds of principles you've created and how it's evolved over time. Here you go. Thanks. Thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming out. I know it's a busy season. Um, so I am going to wear two hats today, the DMA, for whom I work, and the DAA, with whom I work closely. Um, since Mike is not here to speak, I will try to convey some of what he would have talked to you about as well, though sadly not with his smooth baritone. Um, the, so I think personally this uh, particular self-regulatory program that I'm going to talk about is an excellent example of what Daniel just talked about in terms of all of the benefits without the negative possibilities of what self-regulation could hold. Um, so we can talk about exactly what that means um, and why it is uh, self-reg is the right choice for the OBA area and sort of online more generally. So first of all, what is the DAA, the Digital Advertising Alliance? was created by a group of uh, advertising and marketing associations, DMA included, also the 4As, the ANA, the AAF, the IAB, in consultation with the BBB and the NAI, more acronyms than you could ever want. Um, that group represents about 5,000 companies and pretty much the entire online advertising ecosystem. So we brought together those organizations and a host of companies pretty much representing every actor in that complicated online advertising and uh, technology environment um, to answer concerns from Congress, from the FTC, and to some extent from consumers about the practice of behaviorally targeted advertising online. And the DAA itself, the Digital Advertising Alliance, is meant to be the home for that self-regulatory program that grew out of the self-regulatory principles for online behavioral advertising that industry jointly uh, put out in 2009. So those principles, um, hopefully you guys are familiar at this point with our blue book, the DAA blue book of uh, OBA principles. The template for our book was really the FTC's principles. They came out with a staff report in 2009 with self-regulatory principles for online behavioral advertising. We took the same seven principles of transparency, consumer choice, sensitive data, accountability, along with data security, stuff about material changes and education. And we basically adopted that sort of model, that template, and built it out, operationalized those principles with an actual self-regulatory program. Um, the way we live those principles is really through two tools primarily. One, again, that I hope you are fully familiar with at this point, is the online, um, the advertising option icon. 
Uh, you should be seeing it now on just about every behaviorally targeted ad across the entire internet. Uh, it is intended to alert consumers to the fact that behavioral targeting is occurring, and then with one easy click, they can learn more about what OBA is, who it is that is serving that ad, and if they so choose, then to click through easily to an opt-out where they can opt out of that company's OBA targeting or the entire ecosystem of online behavioral advertising. Obviously, that requires a concerted opt-out choice for consumers, which we've built at aboutads.info. That's the DAA's website home. Um, there's a, uh, an opt-out mechanism there that, again, covers about 90% of all of the OBA online at this point, and we're working hard to close that last 5% or so gap in the coming year. Um, but the DAA is now a full-fledged nonprofit organization. It is separate from the associations, but they form its governing board. Uh, we have a manager, Peter Kazmala, who manages the day-to-day -day affairs, ably assisted by the team at Venable for Council and a fantastic program coordinator, who I'm glad to say I hired myself. Um, and as far as who's participating in that structure that we've now built, uh, we have seen absolutely exponential growth in terms of both companies getting involved and consumers responding to the program. In less than a year, we've had 400 plus companies come on board. Um, I can show you some of the, uh, the various names here. I'm not sure if the picture will pick that up, but it's a pretty stellar list if you can come take a look afterwards. Pretty much all of the major brands, all of the um, behavioral advertising folks involved in that process. And we've gone from zero, not zero to 60, but zero to 600,000, 600 billion ad impressions in our first year. And we are now at a rate of 900 billion ad impressions per month. 900 billion per month being served across the ad ecosystem. Um, we've got about 1.5 million consumers who have interacted with the opt-out, the consumer opt-out page that we've built, but we've got about 57,000 consumers visiting that site every week now to learn about OBA, most of whom are not choosing to opt-out, but we want to make sure that they have the resource there to understand what's going on. Most of that interaction on the website we know is being driven by interactions with that icon out in the wild. Um, as you can now, any website that you could possibly put into a Google or a, a Bing search term, um, you will end up on some sort of site that has an, an icon there, uh, most likely. And on your mobile Sorry, and on your mobile device. Um, so as far as growth in the future, um, I, I would be remiss with Morgan sitting next to me not saying that we've also been focusing closely on small business in the past few months. We partnered with Quantcast to launch a small business compliance tool. We want to make it really easy, not just for the big guys, but for everybody on down in the ecosystem to comply with this program and to get guidance, to receive guidance on how to comply. That will continue to be an important, important focus. And enforcement has also been a huge focus in the last year, particularly for DMA, and, and Jeannie can talk about BBB. The accountability principle, the seventh of those uh, OBA principles, is operationalized through the DMA and the BBB together. We are responsible for monitoring and enforcing compliance. We are managing consumer complaint resolution. Um, we are policing the entities actively who are engaged in OBA, and we're helping to bring them into compliance. We're really focusing very much on turning bad actors into good actors, as we think that's the best outcome for consumers. Um, we at DMA have more than four decades of experience with self-regulation. Our self-regulatory guidelines for ethical business practice cover every marketing channel you can think of and pretty much every marketing practice you can think of. So uh, we have a model for enforcement that is long-standing and we have simply built these principles into it such that all DMA members are required to comply with them, but we're actually taking action against both member and non-member companies across the whole ecosystem. So um, we do that through a committee on ethical business practice that is in, in set up within DMA um, with experts in how all of these complicated practices work and what the best practices in industry are. Uh, we take complaints from consumers, from member companies, non-members, and we actually get a decent amount from consumer protection agencies or consumer organizations as well, all of which we look into. Um, we investigate, again, members and non-members, and we start out with a confidential process, again, really aimed at explaining to the company what went, possibly went wrong and helping them to come into compliance. That is 
by and large, where the process ends because folks do want to do the right thing. If that isn't true for some reason, though, we have a fairly robust toolkit of sticks to use, um, beginning with if they're members, they will no longer be DMA members. Um, if they are uh, non-compliant uh, and non-members, we will publicly announce the company as non-compliant. And if there is um, an understanding of a possible uh, illegal action, possibly likely under Section 5, then we will serve them up on a platter to the FTC, which we have done again for the past four decades. So nothing new to us. Um, as far as the OBA side of things, though, we DMA probably in about the last 20 months, we've gotten over 15,000 consumer contacts. Um, I'll be honest, only about 100 of those were OBA related. There is a whole wide world of things that consumers are concerned about, and this is a fraction of it. Um, I can't speak to ongoing casework about OBA cases in particular, though I will say that we have some in process. Um, but by and large, the contact that we have received from consumers about OBA practices is much less about non-compliance with the self reg program or the principles, and much more about not yet understanding what exactly is is OBA and what are the choices that they've got. Um, I was talking to my, my uh, counterpart in our compliance department who said, it's the dating sites. I won't, you know, not to throw stones, but people are coming to us and saying, my girlfriend saw that there was an icon on, you know, a dating site ad, and I don't want to have, you know, I don't want her to think I'm looking elsewhere. So we explain to consumers how it is that they can opt out of that kind of behavioral targeting. Totally fine. We've also got a lot of folks that come to us that don't want a certain type of ads, but they do want another type. So we make sure that they're aware of all of the different ad preference managers that are out there now to tweak, you know, what kind of advertising you, you do want to receive. And I think by and large, this is showing us that the program itself is working and working well, but that we need to continue focusing on consumer outreach and education so that folks are well versed in what it is that they have in terms of the choices that we're putting out there. So Dan, Daniel, you had asked about how the rules were established. Um, quick, just quickly, when we got started, the associations brought together all of those member companies and, and convened a very large and very diverse table, again, with all of the different kind of actors in the, that ecosystem, because we thought there's no point in putting this together if everybody can't agree to it at the end of the day. So we looked at what is actually occurring, not just the hype, but what are companies actually doing, good and bad actors both, how the technology works, and then over the course of only nine months, we brought that entire table around to agreement on a single hashed out self-regulatory framework that everybody could live with. Um, and I think because of that process and all of the hard work that went into it, uh, some I should say before I ever arrived and, and when I was still sort of throwing stones at a previous job, um, the DAA is now the forum, the forum for convening the industry to solve these kinds of self-regulatory issues around online advertising. Um, those first nine months um, included a lot of proprietary discussions about what folks were doing, what they could live with, how the technology would work for all of us to coordinate in this one process. And now that we've worked out the kinks and have that platform for cross-industry collaboration with everybody at the table and willing to work with one another, um, we think that that's the way to go going forward, not just for OBA, but I'll, I'll talk now briefly about what's coming next and, and the fact that we're not sitting on our, on our laurel, resting on our laurels, sitting back on our heels with this thing. We have actually just come out with an addendum to the principles, first my purple book. This is the little brother of the big blue. Um, just last month, we used that same cross-industry platform to bring folks together and uh, release an addendum to the original principles focused on multi-site data. So we've significantly expanded the original self-reg for OBA um, beyond OBA to establish a comprehensive self-regulatory set of standards for the collection and use of multi-site data more generally. So multi-site data being data collected from a particular computer or device um, regarding web viewing across time and across unaffiliated sites but not just for OBA purposes. So that category of multi-site data, uh, much more broadly uh, defined, not just data that would be used for OBA going forward. So 
there's the, the whole regime now applies to that set of data as well. And particularly, the, st the thing that's probably gotten the most hype coming out of this release is the fact that we set up a regime restricting the use of that kind of uh, multi-site data for eligibility purposes. This is something that we've heard um, concerns on the Hill and from the FTC and from others. Um, Chairman Lee Woods at the FTC is fond of using the example of if you buy a deep fryer online, will that mean that your insurance company will no longer provide you with uh, health insurance? We don't think that we're confident that's not happening in the first place, but we felt confident enough that we have had the entire industry agree and put in writing and agree to be enforced the fact that we won't use that kind of data for employment eligibility, credit eligibility, healthcare treatment eligibility, or insurance eligibility, including underwriting and pricing and all of those things. So there's also more in there about sensitive data and accountability, um, but I will suffice to say all of this is now covered by that same accountability mechanism that the DMA and the BBB provide to the larger self-regulatory model. Um, finally, what comes next? Uh, on the heels of this purple book coming out, we are, as, as Morgan said earlier, um, we're already focused on mobile. Um, now that this purple is out of the way, we hope to move forward with a, a implications for how OBA and the self reg program apply in that mobile context. It's, it's doubly complicated now that we're dealing with both browsers and apps and everything else that, that goes along there. But again, we've got this great group that is working together and, and I think getting very close to a solution on that side of things as well. Um, the other thing that we're really going to be focused on again is consumer education. We had a little bit of a chicken and egg problem with you can't explain to folks what this icon is if they're not already seeing it everywhere. Um, we're starting to think of it a little bit like that recycling symbol. You know, you started seeing it and you're like, what the heck is that? And then over time, eventually, with great education campaigns, we all know exactly what to do now when we see that. We hope the same will shortly become true with this icon. Folks will um, know what to do when they see it, how to exercise their choices, and, and feel more comfortable with the environment generally. Um, I don't want to ruin anybody else's great surprises, but I would stay tuned for a, a big, fancy, exciting education campaign coming just after the start of the year. So we're also working on international expansion, and um, I think a, a good place to stop is that we are, again, continually looking at these principles, to Dan's point about um, how quickly and uh, nimbly we can adapt as this nothing moves faster than technology in the internet space and we are moving as quickly at that same pace in order to make sure that we're keeping up on the consumer protection side of things as our businesses go forward and do great and wonderful things. Great. Thank you, Rachel. Um, sure. I think, Matt, why don't you maybe chime in now a little bit about what you're seeing in your specific industry. I think that'll add an interesting uh, short perspective. Short. Um, is my microphone. Can everybody hear me? Okay, great. So, uh, my name is... He's good. He's lit. No, I didn't. I didn't sound right. <laughs> I think ours is just really live. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, anyway, it's Matt Stanton. I'm with uh, Beam Global. Uh, we're the largest U.S.-based spirits company. Uh, and I do all of our uh, lobbying and our sub corporate social responsibility, which may surprise you that a lobbyist would do all of our corporate <laughs> social responsibility. But from that perspective, uh, Daniel and I were talking and wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, the spirits industry and the code review process that we do have, and actually how we've evolved that process into social media. I'll also talk a little bit about how important social media has become to our company. Uh, I would say about five years ago, it was about 10% of what we were, uh, our advertising dollars, it's now close to 50%. Uh, and I think that trend's gonna continue in the future. So let me talk about the Discus code first. Uh, it's online, everybody can go look at it, it has, 34 different content provisions, and then it has eight different uh, placement provisions. The content provisions, I won't go over all of them, but it has everything from uh, health claims to sexual prowess, sexual success, all different types of things that we don't want any of our advertisings, uh, advertisements to uh, uh, basically portray. And so from that perspective, um, I'll, I'll go through a little bit about how the code review process works and then how it applies to social media. On the code review process, and I think part of the importance of why it works and why it has teeth is because anyone can bring a complaint. Uh, that means any consumer can bring a complaint. 
uh, any company can bring a complaint. And believe me, I incentivize our employees to figure out our competitors' ads and see if we can bring them before the code review process. Uh, it's a little bit of fun when you get to go to the chief marketing officer of another company and have them pull all of their advertisements and their ad buys. So that's something that's, uh, I think, important as part of the code review process. So immediately the complaint comes into the DISCUS code review process. It is then immediately sent to the advertiser that uh, is allegedly uh, in fra infraction here. And then they have 15 days to respond. The code review uh, board meets. Uh, it deliberates on it, and then it issues an opinion. For all DISCUS code review members, they have to immediately pull the advertisement if it's uh, in violation, and, it, uh, and we mean immediately. Uh, DISCUS, by the way, represents uh, about 85% of the spirits industry, so it's all of the, the, the big suppliers that are out there. And so at the end of the day, and I think one of the more important things is any uh, decision that comes down is part of uh, annual report, actually a quarterly report, that Discus puts out there and puts out on the website. So uh, there is 100%, as I told you, with Discus uh, members, uh, but there's also uh, even the members that aren't Discus members, they do want to comply because they don't want it out there. Uh, they don't want that uh, transparency, that, that document out there, which shows they've been in violation. And so as we were uh, going through that process of um, kind of the code review, uh, I can give you some examples uh, uh, of the content. Obviously, we don't want to portray things uh, that advertise with children. Uh, a company called Loft had an advertisement where they said, uh, how could you not buy liquor from this child? So that was obviously in violation. Uh, went through the overview board process. That didn't take us too long. Uh, and they immediately pulled that ad. Another example is uh, Sweet Carolina Sweet Tea Vodka. Uh, they are actually a Discus member. Uh, and they had a bunny playing with uh, women uh, in underwear. Uh, they were playing cards. Uh, didn't work out. Violated the code review process, immediately thrown out. They immediately had to deal with their advertisement. And then another example, I actually, hopefully Diageo is not in the room, I brought this complaint. Uh, it was a uh, advertisement where they had 25-year-old uh, uh, people, they were breaking through, um, a uh, pool which was clearly locked and they were jumping in a foam filled pool. Uh, they thought, I, we thought that it violated the provision dealing with illegal activity and we finally, we actually went through it, we deliberated with them. We didn't win that one, but at the end of the day I think it shows you that each member company is conscious about the other company's advertising. And so it's a very good uh, way of having teeth uh, in the process. Now, as I told you, we were moving into social media, uh, and when it comes to social media, um, it was very important for us to be able to communicate with consumers in a different way. We call it kind of a, I told you, Maker's Mark is one of our brands, perfect example. They are very much into uh, pull marketing, not push marketing. The idea is having an engagement with consumers uh, about their advertisements. I don't know if it's ever happened to you before, but I've been in a bar before, sitting there, <laughs> drinking a, a, a bourbon, and somebody will come up to me and say, have you tried Maker's Mark? And we think this person is, uh, you know, just, you would think it's just a very strange person coming up to you in a bar. <laughs> but what it is, is Maker's Mark does ambassadors. They have ambassadors, they have over a million ambassadors out there, and it's all about word of mouth, uh, mouth marketing. These are people that are involved with the brand, they love the brand, they love communicating with people. So as social media came out, it was very important for us to be able to use that media to kind of have that same kind of conversation with consumers. But with that said, we had to enforce the DISCUS code, and we had to figure out a way to get the DISCUS code to apply to the social media standards. And so what we did was we took those standards and tried to apply them to social media as much as we could. So from a placement standpoint, we had to obviously verify that 72%, uh, which is the current industry standard, of an audience was above the legal purchase age. That means anytime we put an advertisement in social media or any media for that matter, 72% of the audience has to be above the legal purchase age. We have to be able to verify that within the information that uh, whether it's Comscore, whether it's Nielsen, whether it's other, any of that other data, um, we have to verify that in order to place an ad there. We also do 21 plus age gating uh, when anyone goes to any of our brand websites. So you can't go to one of our brand websites, whether that was Baker's Mark, Jim Beam, uh, Cavassier, any of our websites without getting that age affirmation uh, information that you have to have in the beginning. Um, one of the tougher things, to be perfectly honest, is uh, user-generated content. Obviously, when you have Facebook and you have some of these other things, uh, 
people do some pretty crazy things when they talk about Maker's Mark and they put up posts and ads and other things. And so we regularly check those uh, pages and we will immediately take anything that we feel is inappropriate, uh, whether that's uh, over consumption, whether that's, uh, uh, you know, one that we had to deal with was somebody was holding a bottle of Maker's Mark like a little baby in a towel. So we took that one down. We didn't like that. Uh, <laughs> And so it's, uh, but the user-generated content is, it's very difficult because it's constantly evolving. So uh, we internally uh, have people that are always looking at the brands and the websites and pulling those things down. Um, obviously we have privacy policies on collecting uh, personal information. We have to clearly identify uh, any brand uh, marketing. So if we're on a blog we, and, and we're marketing that, that's ourselves, we have to obviously uh, disclose that when we are uh, marketing that. And then, uh, obviously, uh, we have procedures for forwarding downloaded digital content where it has to be 21 plus. So if uh, someone forwards an advertisement, some, someone forwards anything else, we have to, again, try and age gate those people, whether it's a, a mobile device, whether it's uh, you know blog, social networking, we always try and apply it uh, to all of those things. And so the teeth in all of it, again, is that each member company uh, is regulating its own advertising, but they're also regulating their competitors' advertising. And from that perspective, um, it's been a process that the FTC has amended uh, on many uh, occasions. The FTC is uh, obviously always doing uh, different reports uh, and is engaged with us on kind of what are the new trends. I tell you, one of the tough things that we've had is Twitter. Uh, Twitter is one of those, uh, uh, it, it's a great, way to communicate with consumers, uh, the challenge there is you can't uh, always age gate uh, and you, even if you're trying to get age affirmation, it's very difficult under, the, under that uh, module. But I think the, the key commitment from the industry's perspective is that we'll continue to evolve as technology evolves. Um, and from that perspective, uh, the FTC said great things about us, some of the uh, <coughs> groups have. And I think from that perspective, we've, we've had some of the other competitors, pharmaceuticals, others look at our the way we do the process as a good way in self-regulation uh, to address some of these issues. So uh, I think that's kind of an overall view, kind of the way we see it. Uh, and obviously, if you have any questions at the end, uh, we're happy to answer. Great. Um, so we'll move over to, to Morgan and just say we're planning to get plenty of time for questions at the end. Uh, we'll end there right at the very end. So you want to keep it short? Keep it short. All right. <laughs> well, so I'm the pointy end of the stick, in a sense. Um, I represent mobile apps developers, and now we're closing in on 5,000, and uh, hopefully very soon we'll do a big thing because we're probably going to hit about 1 million. We'll hit our 1 millionth application available on, on one of the multiple stores, whether it be Windows Store, was Frank, um, whether it be Blackberry Store, whether it be Apple Store, whether it be one of the numerous Google stores, including Amazon's. So we're going to hit a million apps. And guess what? You guys, how many here have smartphones? Hands up. Thank you very much. On behalf of my members, thank you, thank you. And I bet most of you didn't pay more than 99 cents to about $3.64 per any application that you got. So, how the heck do we survive? How do the millions of apps that are available, because there are millions on multiple platforms, how do the more than 90,000 developers make a living? Well, OBA, advertising. We're supplementing what we do for that 99 cent application that you bought with some help from our friends over here. So we're the ones that face the customer. But here's the irony. All the companies that you heard them talk about have big legal budgets, big departments, big groups. So we're dependent very much on what they're doing on their end to influence and inform us. Because on average, and we did some, we did some research prior to one of the hearings, we looked at the top 500 apps across all of the platforms. And here's what we found. 88% are small businesses. And when I say small businesses, I don't mean 250 to 500 according to SBA. I mean under 10 employees. Under 10 employees across the industry. When we looked at their experience, it was a very interesting breakdown. Uh, there was more experience than we expected. Um, over, over about 40% had more than two plus years of experience in the industry. But you know what? Most of these guys, they were the former backroom guys writing uh, you know, Oracle DBMS applications and working on SharePoint servers. For the first time in their career, they're doing something customer facing, consumer facing. So it's a completely new environment for them. And this is great, right? It has rejuvenated the industry. As we always say, I always thank my members for pulling our economy back from the abyss. Um, and, uh, and when you say, well, how on earth did we do that? Well, 
we expect this year that the mobile apps economy will generate about $7 billion, and by 2015, we're on schedule to hit $50 billion, with a B. And we like that number. So this is enormous. This is happening on tiny companies, and it's happening with big dollars. But it's an interesting partnership, because each one of these companies, the top 500, under 10 employees, doesn't have a compliance department like Rachel, like Rachel has. And on top of that, we have some, we have some power asymmetry. Um, I don't get to go to my advertiser and say, you know, I'm concerned about this term on subpara 3 comma A. I'm not sure my users will like that. No. We either click through and agree, or we find another advertiser. So we become very dependent on industry self-regulation through organizations like the one sitting on my left, because we have a power asymmetry that we can't do the kinds of negotiations that um, you know, one of the larger, larger members that might be in part of these organizations can do. So we're dependent on that. Now, separately, we have our own industry self-reg as the Mobile Apps Trade Association. But we also have a little bit of an information gap. Remember I said these are companies under 10. But something else that most of you need to remember, this mobile apps economy in its current form didn't exist in 2008. Didn't exist. In application purchasing, it's less than a year old. Subscriptions, well, we're about six months old. Advertising in the mobile app platform, mobile platform space is, well, we're just about at two years. Two years, 24 months. Heck, the financial services industry had, what, 50 years to clean up their information practices? We haven't even had 50 months. So we're still in a stage where we're experimenting with business models. And one of the models that we're experimenting with is advertising. How do we generate revenue? How do we percent protect our consumers? Because while somebody might get torqued off about um, uh, learning about a dating site, they often blame the application. Right? They don't. They don't. They look at the. They look at the the uh, forward eye icon, and they you know they might click on it, but they want to know what is that? Why, why does this app know about me? They get mad at the app developer. Again, the guy with less than ten employees. So we have our own guidelines that we have in place to help inform our people. And we work with uh, organizations like um, privacychoice.org, which has a great build-it-yourself privacy policy. And I always use that. I use privacychoice.org because it's a great subversion technique for my own members. I go to members and say, one of the questions I ask on all of my presentations is, how many of you have a privacy policy? Eh, a few hands go up. And I say, well, how, why not? We go through the various questions too expensive, I'd have to hire a lawyer, I don't know, I'm not collecting any information. Number one, number one reason I hear, I'm not collecting information. Well, in truth, a lot of us are. Whether it be through analytics or what we're sharing with our advertising partners, we are collecting information. And when stuff gets out, they don't blame the folks over in Rachel's group, they blame us. So part of what we've been doing with organizations like Privacy Choice is pushing our membership to learn and build their own privacy policies and what's fascinating is the act of building a privacy policy helps them realize where they're engaged and where they're intersecting with their advertising partners. On the website, when you pull down and you say, what are the advertising networks you use? And it's a click down menu. Click, 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 boom. All sorts of new information in your privacy policy. Oh, wow, that, that changed. Oh, analytics, click. Oh, oh, all of a sudden, new information. So the act of making a privacy policy in and of itself is helping to inform our members. So at the pointy end of the stick, where we're putting into place the self-regulatory guidelines that are being provided to us by our advertising networks and the partners that we have, we still have three things that we have to do. We have an information, we have an education gap with our members that's ongoing. We have an experimentation stage that we're still at, where we haven't all figured out all the business models. And finally, I think that um, there's also a certain level of uncertainty about where the government action will be in the future. And one of the things that our membership is, is interested in, and, and I know Dan is something that Dan's worked on as well, is, is looking at ways to be multi-stakeholder, to work with government agencies and private industry as part of the multi-stakeholder. We've been very pleased that we've been able to work with uh, the, advertising, uh, the advertising folks and to get a seat at the table on behalf of the little guys and say, hey, this is, how, this is what the problems we might have, right? I asked you all how many of you have smartphones. Well, if, the, if that triangle on your, on your app was larger than the application itself, that kills you. As an, ad as an app developer, you don't want your user interface dictated by the, by the industry self-reg guidelines. You want to be able to fit the guidelines, 
the portal to information in something that fits within your user interface. So we have three things we're still working on. Education, experimentation, and finding ways to be part of this multi-stakeholder environment as we move forward. But um, the good news is uh, mobile apps are here to stay. Mobile apps are, are awesome. And, um, and we are really reinventing, we are really reinventing the ability for folks to get um, information that's valuable to them and even advertising that's valuable to them wherever they are. So I will try to keep mine short and turn it over to Dan. Great. Thanks, Morgan. Um, I have a couple questions for the panelists. I want to give Rachel a chance to, to respond to what you've heard. Um, are the other people, especially in regards to... I agree. <laughs> uh, especially in regards to two things. I think one, you know, an issue that's really important to a lot of people is how, uh, how this Department of Commerce multi-stakeholder approach can work with the existing self-regulatory efforts. Is it a complement? Is it a substitution? You know, how, how do those two blend together? Um, and also, I want you, if you can, to address a little bit more about how the actual rule setting process works. Um, because I think there's you know, the belief that when companies get together, they're, you know, they're hurting the people who aren't at the table, and in this case, typically, the thought is the consumer. But when you look at the rules that come out of this, I mean, as you said, it, it really followed what the FTC said. And when you look at how they're crafted, it's actually not a, a low bar. It's kind of a high bar. So how does that play out? Well, I think, God, this is so, this is so boom. Boom. Um, So I, I think first I'll sort of I'll, I'll shift the paradigm a little bit to say that we have a multi-stakeholder process. Um, and I think, you know, I, I think folks recently with, with the Department of Commerce report coming out and the stakeholder process that they've um, suggested there, we wouldn't disagree that it is important to have a multi-stakeholder process. I think um, part of the misperception about self-regulation is that it is industry acting alone and doing it by itself and not engaging with others. Um, you know, I, I think it, in the particular case of the OBA self-reg program, as I said earlier, uh, the conversation began with the FTC. They, in conversation over a course of months and probably over a year uh, with folks in industry and consumer groups, et cetera, they received a lot of information in a multi-stakeholder process, came out with these seven principles that folks sort of agreed were very important for uh, the industry to, to work with. And we sort of took it from there and continued that multi-stakeholder process by going internal for the first part to the industry and saying, okay, here's the framework. Now, how do you actually make it work? There is such a huge gap between theory and practice, in, especially in the technological world. Um, you know, my former role was trying to do regulatory compliance within a company on privacy and data security, and so I know firsthand exactly how hard it is to go from what it says on the page to how that plays down out in your 15 business units or whatever it is. Um, so we went, you know, sort of deep underground and, and really looked at what was possible, technologically speaking, and then came back up and resurfaced in conversations with the FTC and actually with consumer groups as well um, to say, okay, here's what we've come up with, here's what we think is technologically and, and policy-wise feasible and, and works within our business models. Shoot at it, right? Tell us what works and what doesn't. And we continued to adapt that model over the course of the next few months after that with that input. So, um, you know, and, and we're continuing to do that now, you know, as we, you know, bring in different folks, um, Morgan is one example, uh, other groups as we move into looking at different areas and different technologies, and we absolutely will continue to do that. We have, a, a, I'd say, an extremely good relationship with the FTC in having that very respectful back and forth where they, of course, continue to push us as hard as they possibly can to do better, but also recognize what we're doing and, and continue to, to have that fruitful discourse. Yeah, you know, I, I think it's interesting um, one of the points that we, we try and emphasize in, in the report we put out today is that when you see you know actions being taken against a company, um, that is part of a healthy self-regulatory environment. Absolutely. And Absolutely. you know sometimes that's that's seen as okay this bad thing happened self-regulation isn't working but that's actually a symptom that you know the processes are in place and, and that what you Want to happen to that. And in, oh, sorry, I was just going to say, per perception-wise, one of the difficult things with self-reg, again, is most of the DMA's enforcement actions never become public because we are successful in turning that bad actor into a good actor. And, you know, 
um, Matt talked about how difficult it can be for a company if that does go public that they made a misstep, right? And, and especially when they are now willing to make sure very closely that they don't in the future. And so we only go public when they show an unwillingness to be non-compliant. And that's, you know, again, a very important part of, uh, the, unfortunately, the only part that becomes public, but showing that it's working when we do serve up the, the bad guys on a platter. Um, that that's an important part of the way it works. I like the, the newspapers where you only see the, the bad things. <laughs> but I think it's, right. it's important that the FTC has the authority, and we believe they do under Section 5, to, um, to really go after the ones who are particularly nasty. Uh, in part because um, marching somebody out in an orange jumpsuit in handcuffs is incredibly educational for other developers, especially those who are, you know, probably being a little fringy. Uh, one of the best things that's happened this year was when the FTC went against two different mobile apps companies. I took that message, I took that message to the streets. I went to developer conferences all over the United States and I was able to put a slide up and said, this guy, this guy spent mon more money in lawyers than he's ever made in his entire life. You don't want to be this guy. And so having that there, being able to say unequivocally, the FTC has authority over mobile applications, sorry, we know, we help. It made it a lot easier for all of these people. And remember, if you've ever actually been in a tiny business where you were signed the front of the paycheck, a lot of the instinct is keep your head down. Don't look up. Don't ask questions. Don't be involved. Don't get engaged. Because you're busy trying to make sure that you don't have to borrow more money from your mom next month to make payroll. That's a small businessman's reality. So having those defining moments of orange jumpsuit, handcuffs, big fines is an important tool. Now, we don't want it to go to the other extreme where everybody's, uh, where everybody's getting prosecuted, but we think ones that are good lesson points for the small business community are important and they serve a really good function to get everyone else to toe the line and to get the ones who might be might be um, playing fast and loose to shape up. So I think the FTC's authority is really good and I think I think that, that uh, the, the administration's Department of Commerce, the Green Paper and eventually the White Paper, I think that we have to give them some credit for the fact that their multi-stakeholder outlook does represent um, small business voices as well as all the usual suspects of of key advocates on, on both sides of big business and um, and, uh, and consumer. So uh, we have to give them some real, some real credit for bringing small business to the table there. Uh, Matt, I want to bring you in on this, and I'd like you to talk a little bit about, you know, one of the key principles for, for DISCUS is, of course, um, marketing to uh, individuals that are above the legal drinking age. And uh, online behavioral advertising gives you the ability to do that in a new way. And so can you talk a little bit about how you know, you use this new technology? Sure. Um, well, obviously, uh, and maybe it uh, warrants a little bit of discussion, um, through the FTC, the FTC's issued reports in 1999, 2003, they did one in 2008, we expect another one just on alcohol advertising and where we're going. And the digital platform was one of their you know, major concerns as, as we uh, um, approached this. Uh, from, from our perspective, um, uh, what we've tried to do and, and to understand this, uh, back in 19, I guess 99, the industry only had a 51% placement standard. You only had to verify that 51% of the audience was above the legal purchase age. The FTC didn't think that was high enough. We didn't really think it was high enough at the time. And so we had to go to a higher standard and we had to understand what that higher standard was. Why did we pick 70%, 72%? And so what we decided to do was ground it in the census. And the census information says that 72% of the, the adult population is above the legal purchase age. So in our, our concept, we should advertise to exactly um, uh, that population and only to that population. And so uh, media buying, as you know, can be a little bit more art than science sometimes. Um, but I think uh, what we've tried to do is, you know, obviously we have to verify that data. Um, for any of these advertisements. And so it's easy with Facebook. Uh, and uh, interestingly, when we started with Facebook, we would verify the data and we'd show you know, that we were compliant. But then Facebook, knowing our advertising, wanting our advertising, gave us 21 plus only sites. So we were able to target directly 21 plus on Facebook on these different sites, which is terrific because in our view, it's the evolution of this process, right? Which is 
Um, they want our advertising. They understand we only want to hit a 21% demographic, so they're going to literally give us 100% 21% plus demographic. And so uh, we, we've done that with magazines in the past where the magazines will give us special bindings um, that are only 21 plus. But I think that's the key um, as this whole process evolves. Um, at the end of the day, Facebook and some of these other companies want our advertising and uh, they learn about our code, the apps learn about our code, uh, what we need, and they evolve their technology um, so that we can uh, come on board. So it's been critical for us. As, as I mentioned, there's, you know, as we go along, blogs, uh, and user-generated content is tough. Um, you know, we, we try and do that. There, there is a perception that Facebook um, is, some people lie on Facebook. They, they say they're uh, 21, but they're really only 15. I think what we found is that their friends call them out. You know, if you go up and you sign up, you say you're, fifth, you, you say you're 21, but you're 15, Facebook has a way of kind of cleaning their own house. Uh, and uh, from that perspective, we don't see that as much. I think one of the challenges we had early on was age affirmation, right? It's not age verification when you go to our site, it's just age affirmation. You have to say you're, uh, uh, obviously put in your birthday and say you're over 21. Um, to date, there's just no technology out there that we that we can see that can verify quickly what how old the person is. Uh, if that would ever happen, if there were some kind of seamless uh, effort to actually verify people's age, I, I think we would look at that technology, but we'll continue to evolve as the code evolves. The problem with that, of course, gets into into the other side of that, which when you start verifying people's age and, and that kind of precision, a lot of us who care about privacy get very concerned very quickly. So it is a catch-22, and we have it on mobile, too. It was interesting. This question about yeah. how do I verify age on a mobile device, it's like, well, I don't want you knowing that much about me. Yeah, Ann Hodger Bush did it, uh, I would say, about five years ago. There was a technology that would uh, go in and someone would put in their uh, information that it would go verify to try and pull DMV records. Lots of those same uh, problems came out and Anheuser Bush got crushed for it and they stopped it right away. So, um, you know, I think at the end of the day, um, you know, one of the challenges we have right now is on Twitter. Uh, it, it is something we want to use. It's something we want to uh, have as a platform and it's, it's just difficult there uh, on, on, on verifying the 21 plus. Daniel, can I just add to that? I think that the Anheuser, not just that on Anheuser Bush in particular, but no, no, I, think that <laughs> okay. um, I think that is Twisting such a good example. I mean, a bad outcome to some extent, but a really good outcome from a self-regulatory perspective of somebody was trying to push the envelope in terms of a, you know, a new kind of technology that was going to get a better, you know, a better verification from the consumer perspective, et cetera, et cetera. They didn't do it successfully, but the marketplace told them that very quickly, and they righted the ship. And I think that, in and of itself, I mean, we're here representing the the models of self-regulation, but those kinds of small interactions, I think, are another important way in which self-regulation occurs on a daily basis. We learn from failure. Sure. Um, I want to go ahead and open up questions. Before I do that, I'll have a, a plug for an ITI report specifically looking at electronic ID issues. And, um, do you like a copy of it? Do you? Yeah, I, I do have a copy here. I she has it. Up, but it is on our website. Um, if you are interested in this issue, we took a very deep dive into what other countries are doing in this area and what the U.S. can do. But let me open it up to anyone that has a question, just if you can say your name. Hi. Uh, Chris Gallagher from the ACLU. Uh, thank you. Very, very interesting panel. Um, I think if I can put my consumer hat on, though, the ACLU is obviously more government facing, I think sometimes that we are, you know, consumer, so in some ways we have a little bit of a unique perspective on all of this. Um, I will say that one of the things that we have been most interested in is the do not track mechanism, because we see collection of information potentially being something that the government want, might want to access down the road, especially if we've incentivized a great deal of, of information collection. So I would agree with your characterization that I think many consumer groups do sort of see this as the fox guarding the house. It's like, you know, how can you, you know, if something is really a bad practice or something you really want to do, how could you be relied upon to be the one who prevents yourself from doing it, especially if it's, if it's very profitable? So, but I also hear the concern that regulation may be clunky. It may be, you know, overly restrictive of, of practices that you think are very valuable and, and don't do that much harm. So right now I get there is an ongoing process at the W3C that attempts to create standards for a do not track mechanism. The WC3 is a, is a body made up of 
largely of industry, but it's, it's, it's a standard setting body for the, probably the 1% of you that don't know this, that sets standards for internet, you know, how the internet operates at a fundamental level. If a body like that could come up with a working mechanism for a do not track, that one that could put into effect the sort of consumer's preference not to be tracked, especially not tracked across um, websites, is that fit sort of within the self-regulatory scheme in a way that you would feel comfortable with? I mean, would you feel comfortable with either you know, Congress enacting something like that, or even just saying, we will not track you pursuant to W3C standards and, and putting that sort of very clear language in your policies. I'm just sort of curious as to your response to a process. Okay, that's right. So I, I guess I should take that one with my DAA hat on. Um, and I would say that some of the associations who are a part of the DAA are at the table with W3C. Uh, yes, no, right. um, and I guess I would also say that though I am not particularly fond of the term do not track, I think we've already built it, right? Um, but if you go back to what is the reason for wanting a do not track mechanism in the first place, uh, to your point about so that consumers can have an, an opt out and a choice that is across, uh, across, you know, we'll assume we will have it across devices, um, but for the moment across all browsers. Uh, regardless of where they go on the internet, it is persistent. We are about to have a, a completely persistent uh, opt-out. I think it's, it exists. And I guess if this is really about what is best for the consumer, I would say, you know, it's, it's wonderful to have uh, processes out there, but I, I think it's also important to recognize that that choice exists for consumers, and, and that's really what we've all been working toward. Absolutely. Can I just ask one, I'm sorry, just one thought. So really, this has always been the kind of question I've had it seems like, and I, and I hear that sort of a lot, that we're, we've already built this. It seems like if it's already built, then it, really, it shouldn't be a big deal to have the government go ahead and ratify what is in essence already exists. Now, or sure. have industry say in sort of a, a way that is verifiable, of, you know, or I shouldn't say verifiable, because always the FTC has, has had the, I know, and I've heard that. Yeah. But I mean, again, I think I could just leave it at that question What's, what's wrong with some kind of baseline standard set by an outside, or by, set by the government? I want to say not that. Okay, so we're talking about should there be a government law yes. for do not track? Yes. And I guess I would, I would say, and, and this is not particular to do not track, I think this is um, more specific or, or more generally speaking in an area that is evolving. As, yeah. This is nothing you haven't heard, um, Chris, but an area that's evolving as quickly as uh, the internet and technology, and Morgan gave some great examples, I think codifying that in a law at this point is speaking to the past. And I, I, I mean, I just, I don't think that that will provide an additional benefit to consumers. We already have the very strong FTC toolkit to, as, as a basically a backstop to self-regulation. Um, so I, I just, I think that that's a, that, that is looking to the past. And I, I think the fact that we've already had to come out with a new set of principles and we're working on mobile, et cetera, et cetera, speaks to the fact that we will continue to evolve this much faster than a static law could protect consumers. I think, I think the example of, you know, and I use privacychoice.org as an example because it has pull-down menus. And the reason it has pull-down menus, and, and, and there's a couple of sites doing this, is because the stuff changes all the time. And he actually, you know, you get updates. If there's a material change to one of the, one of the uh, suppliers that's giving you ads, it changes your privacy policy. This whole thing is changing so quickly. Uh, Jonathan Zuck always uses this line, and it, it really is true in this specific question, that nobody wants technology at the speed of government. And I think that that's the real danger. Um, I think the W3C process is good. I like, I, I think that that's something when Realistically, it's going to be pushed down to us as the small developers rather than something that we that we dictate and that's fine Because ultimately they, they'll tell us if we want to get a check We need to do what we're told to do in this case, and that's fine I just think it's really hard to put something in stone and have a regulatory body oversee it when again 2008 none of these devices existed 
I think CAN-SPAM is a really instructive example in this area. You know, if you look at, by the time we got a law that made sense and that could have long-term legs in the email area, self-regulation had been doing the same thing for a very long time and successfully in the email area. It was basically codifying, because that technology, my email numbers would, would kill me to hear me say this, but you know, the technology has sort of, um, platforms, right, leveled off in a sense. That is not absolutely not happening in this area yet. And so I think we have to keep um, evolving with it. Um, uh, so. Hi, Jeannie. Hey, Jeannie. <laughs> at, at the risk of repeating what may have already been said, and first apologies for whatever happened in D.C. that kept me uh, sitting in a tunnel for a long length of time, I can give you two examples of why I think uh, codified things in this space. Can you hear those, please? Is this not on? Yeah. Here, take the boomy yeah. mic here. Oh, oh this is the loudest mic. Okay, well, I can be really loud if that's yeah. what you want. Okay, uh, boomy yeah. mic or not. I can give you one example where I think we all agree that a very forward-looking internet law, when it was passed, is now creating bags of trouble. And that's it. And ECPA at its time was a, 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 a very thoughtful, forward-looking law. Now I can give you an example where legislators refrained from legislating about the internet, and that was the 90, 1996 Telecom Act. We now have terrible silos in telecom, but telecom wisely uh, forbore, or at least that is my interpretation of it, from uh, putting in place the kinds of regulation that were at that point felt to be necessary in the telecom arena. We all know that we're now calling for uh, thinking newly about uh, the Telecom Act and the difference between what is telecom and what is uh, internet is terribly blurred. So I think also in privacy, the ways people are going to quote track or what tracking is going to mean and what is acceptable and what is not are so quickly evolving that we are better off evolving with it with self-regulation and as I think Rachel said uh, there is no end to pressure for self-regulation to rethink what it is doing so in that respect I think that it is not only more uh, subtle and changeable on the industry part, but it has to be responsive to uh, people. I, I really, I don't mean to, to I'm sorry. That would be another All right. topic. All right, let's, yeah, let's, we'll come back. If there's time, but. Then, uh, Go ahead. Carl Zero of Network. Dan, when you, when you advertised this event, you said, why is self-reg essential to promote con consumer privacy? And I would like to ask the panel, how do y'all respond to the statements by special interest groups that self-regulation has failed, that we should just take out, take all this and hand it over to the Federal Trade Commission and they will figure it out and make it so. How do you respond when they say that you guys and your plans are not good for consumers and not working? Isn't that what we just did? <laughs> yeah. I mean, honestly, Carl, I think I think we did talk. Oh, sorry, I didn't talk about Mike. I think we did talk uh, about you know valid answers to any anyone saying that we haven't succeeded, that we haven't done enough. I don't have any issue with folks continuing to push us, though, because as Jeannie said, that's what self-regulation is. It is receiving the push from consumers and the government and whoever else thinks that there's a better way to have it done and taking that and actually making it actionable by industry in a way that is both um, continuing to allow the kind of innovation that, that we all love, but also, you know, especially in the marketing industry, we don't have an industry if we don't have a level of consumer trust where folks will engage with the brands. Um, so, you know, we are, we are, we'll continue to respond in those ways and allow that re relationship with consumers to continue happening, um, you know, as that, you know, changes and changes and the pushing will not end, I'm sure. I, 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 I guess, a couple of, right, just to quickly I think one thing that should be noted on what she said, though, is, is about industry self-reg that, that does differentiate from government is the fact that social norms change and technology changes. So 
they have to be constantly evolving. I mean, if I described Facebook to somebody in 1986, they might freak out. But by the same token, certain aspects of the way that we now consider want more privacy in certain cases wouldn't be so strange in 1980s because we didn't have the internet. So I think that industry self-reg actually does a better job of evolving over time quickly to respond to a lot of social norming and a lot of changes in social attitudes about certain things. I want this private or I don't care about this being private has shifted a lot in the last 20 years. I would just add one real quick point. I, I think one of the best judges of success is when your detractors use your system against you. <laughs> and so from, from our disk as code review process, as I told you, anyone can bring a violation. Some of the most sophisticated people are the people that are trying to eliminate our advertising. And they use the system and they, you know, go through the process, they see very deliberative actions, and then, you know, a lot of those ads are actually pulled. So I think from that perspective, um, they'll continue to say that we, we don't, uh, you know, maybe the numbers, they don't like the 72%, they want us to go to a higher percent, but I don't think anybody uh, is, uh, and, and we haven't seen any criticism of the process itself. I see another question, so let me link and we'll go back. So taking up uh, Chris's brief a little bit, because I think the tension here is the important part of what we're talking about. And, and I think it, well, Link only with Ryan, so I'm not, I'm not actually with the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I, uh, get some right? picture, right? so I, get a picture I think I see the point, I think I see the point here. I mean, there's, right. a, there's a point here that I think he's trying to get to, which is, I think, he doesn't, I don't believe what he's saying is they don't want to see evolution in the technology, but they also want to see some certainty, and I think there are examples in industry where we haven't always lived up to what we said we're going to do. And I, NAI is a perfect example. I think people would say that the principles they had were not updated. The FTC actually had, as you know, some uh, hearings on that and had concerns about it. They hadn't been updated for a while. So what makes industry want to keep focused on this? Because right now we're all focused on privacy. And so it's pretty easy to say, yes, industry's going to focus on it. But what happens three or four years down the road when, frankly, things will change and there's not as much focus on privacy? And that happens. Those kind of cycles happen. And just How does the industry keep a focus on this and make consumers certain that these kind of things will stay in place and not you know, get some certainty? Do net tracks another example? How does that get certainty across the industry that we all know how that mechanism works? Well, I, I actually, sorry, Margaret, I, I would argue with the fact that privacy has gone out of vogue, at least in uh, the DMA. I mean, we have, back when the privacy concern was in the 1870s, why were you getting a Sears catalog and your next door neighbor wasn't? Right. That was the first incarnation of marketing privacy concerns, and you know we and that's it was, you know it was way back then that they set up the organization to start and make sure that there were responsible things happening and why that that targeting was happening. And you know I mean the same is true for BBB. I'm sure decades of just evolving as the type of privacy concern has evolved, and and maybe OBA won't be a consumer, God bless, a consumer concern in a few years. There will be something else, there's no doubt, right? And I think the fact that we've all been around doing this a long time gives credence to the fact that we're, we're, wherever it goes, whatever the next it is, that's where we'll be in trying to make sure that that, that line of, of self-regulatory protection continues. And I think, I mean, this is Washington, yeah, just to find the middle, um, and that's okay. I don't think that Senator Schumer from New York will stop finding ways to do um, television spots in front of the Apple store uh, just because it's not invoked. So I think I think I welcome. I, you know, I, it it keeps us all employed in one sense, but it also it also helps make sure that there's some sharp eyes and Chris and everyone else who's on who, who pushes back on it. That's fine. I think it's fine to have some pushback. And so I I, I accept I accept your premise. Um, the good news is is I think that that um, privacy advocates aren't going away. So they'll keep the pressure up and we'll figure out how to all work together and move forward. Right. The, the other thing, I would say two things. First of all, once you have a norm and an expectation, it's very hard to go back on it. Mm -hmm. Secondly, I'm in, uh, my job is accountability. So I'll keep trucking whatever people are doing. And I hope I just continue to get better at it and I continue to do more of it. And that's, that's my task, and that's what I'm going to do. So I also think, though, that norms do evolve. I just look at the speech that uh, Commissioner Brill gave a year ago about the horrors of OBA versus the speeches she's been giving this year about how most people like uh, having interest-based ads, 
but that there are some real privacy abuses. And that one of those abuses is the use of uh, data, such as OBA data, for entitlement purposes. And I think none of us here would disagree with her in any way about that. And that's what the new DAA principles are trying to address. Does that mean that the old DAA principles went away? Certainly not. And that's what I mean about once you get a baseline, that's going to stay there. I just want to add, um, you know, one thing I, I found very interesting when I was reading through some of the um, discus reports recently is that, you know, some of this is an institutional problem, um, and some institutions are very successful. So if you look at, uh, you know, this industry, it, it they've created the first marketing guidelines right after prohibition. And, you know, so it, it's had a long history. <laughs> We're happy to be back in that. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Take it Appeal amendment, come up with some guidelines. <laughs> Talk about pressure, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, you know, most criminal laws are not necessary for most people because they self-regulate based on their upbringing, their religion, and the other values they have. Uh, but not everybody is a good apple, so we have these rules and regulations for the bad <coughs> apples. The kinds of people you represent are mainly good apples and people with very important reputational uh, uh, value, which could be destroyed, in fact, by transgressing uh, some of these norms. But not everybody in the field, or those who break into the field, have that kind of stake in abiding by these regulations. Uh, the government, unfortunately, has a hard time just directing laws to the bad apple. If they want to regulate, they regulate in general language. How does one draw those lines? It may be true that 95% of the market is self-regulated in a consumer protective way, but you want to stop that 5% who may be exploiting the elderly, the disabled, uh, and the like, or who may, in fact, despite the rules, be looking at who purchases those fryers, uh, you know, uh, so that they have a good record in giving insurance. How do you deal with that tension? I think it's a, it's such a good question. It's such a good question, and that is where a lot of the work of DMA and BBB, I, I, I cannot speak for you, but I think okay. Um, I think that's where a lot of the work is, you know, it's it, because this is not meant to cover just the good apples. Um, well, honestly, one of the biggest issues the DMA has in terms of enforcement over time is people using our logo and pretending they're DMA members because it's understood as a trust symbol. And we have this similar concerns with the icon. And I, I you know, Jeannie, you can speak more to the active going out and policing and searching for those folks. Our process is more complete based, but that's absolutely something that we are cognizant of and focused on is making sure that, um, that we are searching for those folks and not just monitoring the good guys, right? Now, as far as the enforcement side of things, um, the FTC has very strong powers to go after those bad guys. And again, we are working in concert with them to make sure that when we find them, we make them aware, make the FTC aware of those, um, understanding that they maybe don't have as many resources as any of us would like to see them have in that area. Jeannie, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I, uh, the one thing I would add is that people sometimes do forget that we are not uh, a membership-driven program. We are an industry-wide program, which means that your bad apples are under my purview. Will they respect what I say to them? Uh, maybe not. If they don't, I do have big brother or sister known as the FTC. And referrals are something we are not afraid of in the slightest. Yeah. I, also, oh, I'm sorry. Go I ahead. was going to say, I also think that it's, again, back to the fact that I'm a technology guy, so I, I like technology and I enjoy it. I don't always agree with what I see on things like the consumerist, but there's been a very interesting movement towards um, a lot more disclosure by others. It used to be you got a bad product. We went through an interesting phase, right? When you lived in a small town, and if, uh, you know, if Carl here sold me a bad product, I bitched to my neighbors at church about the thing that Carl sold me. Well, then we hit this stage where it was impersonal. I didn't, I didn't know my shopkeeper. He was distant from me. I didn't have anybody to complain to. And we're almost coming back to the local shopkeeper. I go on consumers to say, can you believe it? I couldn't get my clip speaker fixed. The woman was rude. This is the name of the store. This is the name of the person. It gets responses. You've seen Twitter be used a lot for this exact question. 
So bad actors can be called out in a way that we haven't seen since probably before this big, before the big suburban sprawl that happened and really separated us directly from the consumer. So it's an interesting thing. Obviously, Rachel's is right. Article one, section five. I mean, we've got we've got section five authority from the FTC, unfair and deceptive. We've all testified. More resources. I want more orange jumpsuits and more handcuffs for the guys who are really bad actors. And I keep using that because I I love the visual. The visual is important to keep other people in line. So I think um, I think it's I think it's all of those. FTC strong visuals on enforcement. And then lastly, this interesting shift that the social networks have produced in allowing us to be a little closer to the purveyor of our products than we have been for the last, say, 40 years. Yeah, and uh, just real quick, I, I think one of the things um, that Jeannie brought up that's real important from us to, and from your perspective, when we first started the, the Discus Code review process, it was only Discus members. The problem was, you had these outlier members, these people that were making products, they were trying to be edgy, they were trying to come up yeah. with the, yeah, some, of the, some of the scariest things we'd seen. So then we said, well, well, that doesn't make any sense because when you blame the alcohol industry, you blame the alcohol industry. You don't, you don't blame certain brands. And that's when we decided to bring in every actor in our industry. And that was key because it doesn't matter, uh, uh, and what, what I said before was, when we deliberate and when we're transparent about it, when we put it out there, these other companies review process, even if they are 10, 15 people, they don't want that kind of brand advertising. And to the consumer aspect of this, we were all about consumers now. I mean, consumers can kill a brand overnight on social media. Um, so I think from that uh, level, we've got to engage, and we've got to engage everybody as much as we can. I want to cycle back to the question that was asked earlier about how do we, I'm Mike Nelson with the uh, George Washington University Communications Culture Technology Program. I want to cycle back to this earlier question, which was, how do we know self-regulation is working? When I was on Capitol Hill, the White House, I learned, never get on the wrong side of a good bumper sticker. <laughs> and the bumper sticker that's out there is, surveys show most Americans are, are not happy with how their privacy is protected online. That's, that's the bumper sticker. You've given us an hour-long infomercial on how great self-regulation is built some very subtle and very sophisticated arguments. But at the end of the day, if you want senators to support your approach, they've got to have a bumper sticker in their head. You know what? If you do it right, they've got a factoid in their head, too. They can say, well, because of self-regulation, X is better. And they don't have that right now. So I, I, I think challenge you. Yeah, I, I, I challenge bumper your bumper sticker. sticker. Give I me the bumper that. sticker. Give me the factoid that yeah. your supporters could use to push back against somebody who comes in. The very simple bumper sticker is, people aren't happy, we got to regulate. You know how I know that people aren't unhappy? Have you seen the sales of mobile apps? Have you seen the sales of mobile devices? People are not fleeing from the purchase of these devices. Uh, what was it, AT&T announced a 9,000% increase on data uses on mobile devices. People, that bumper sticker is a DC bumper sticker. Because when I go out into the rest of the world, because part my job is actually speaking to developers to help them clean up their privacy. And when I ask them, How's this, has this concern been raised with you? They're like, what? I don't get I don't get privacy. I have specific issues about specific ads sometimes. But I don't get asked questions about privacy. So that's a DC bumper sticker. The rest of America is saying, I love this stuff. This is awesome. They love local advertising. They love Yelp. They love Urban Spoon. They love the kinds of things that are being facilitated. So you got the you got the DC you got the inside beltway bumper sticker, not America's bumper sticker. Because America's and bumper sticker is we love it. And there's hundred senators and four hundred and thirty-five representatives who are inside the beltway. Yep. Well, and I, they've I, got that bumper yeah. sticker embedded in their brain and you haven't pushed it out of their head yet. Let me tell you, I've that. spent a lot of time in congressmen and senators' offices lately discussing exactly that bumper sticker. And and I, I will um, refute your premise because I think I am starting to hear, starting to hear, quite a shift in the way folks are talking because I think when you have the bumper sticker that is simply, I'm afraid of X versus I understand the benefits of X and there is a balance there and et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think the rhetoric begins to change in the House and the Senate and I've heard a lot more members of Congress and staff recently 
um, saying, I am just beginning to understand how complicated this is from the technology side of things, which I think is part of where the creepy factor comes from. Um, and I am just starting to understand, to Morgan's point, exactly how vital this is for my constituents from an economic perspective. And therefore, I want to make sure that you folks in self the self-regulatory world are doing the best you possibly can to make this work um, such that we can continue to have that innovation, et cetera. I'm on your side. Yeah, I'll, no, no. Yeah, I'll <laughs> give you my bumper sticker. We've created, saved, or supplemented 600,000 jobs. And when I give that bumper sticker to 435 members of Congress and 100 senators, 600,000 jobs created, saved, or supplemented through the mobile apps economy. I don't really have a lot of problem with that bumper sticker. I'll just give you a really simple one, Mike. Privacy, exercise your choice. Right. It's there. Make sure you have it. But how do you go against the 90% of people surveyed aren't comfortable with the privacy protection they have today? So. When? I, I don't know how to do that in a bumper sticker yet, but I love your challenge. You know I've always liked the challenge. Yes, it's good. Maybe that'll but, be our next education campaign. But, but, you, you but, factoid, yeah, the factoid be, that I have. 90% of people no, no, no. Lying, no matter what. No, mm -hmm. my factoid is when people go to exercise choice, only a tiny, under 10% actually choose to opt out. About, I don't know if I have the stat exactly right. The majority do nothing. And of the rest, they correct their profiles. What people seem to want, and I've seen focus groups about that, we've asked people, do you want it, do you want choice? Everyone says yes. We ask them, are you going to opt out? They say, well, I don't think so, but I want to be able to decide. And I think that that is what people want. They want control of their own information and their own destiny. Are they going to exercise it? I sincerely doubt, except in situations where they feel that the information is truly sensitive, will most people choose to opt out. But they do want the choice, they should have it, and we should continue to make it as simple and universal as we can. Sorry, I, I promised that we did a 2.30 since this is about self-regulation. <laughs> Frank is right there to regulate us, actually. Uh, and actually, I, I don't, I just thank you to the panel. This is a great discussion. <laughs> I think in response to the challenge, I would toss out this, and I'm not a good bumper sticker ad guy, but I think it would be privacy with an exclamation point, which would then beg the question, what do you mean by that? And my response would be, Exactly. I mean, part of the complicated problem in all this is privacy means different things to different people. And I think what this discussion shows is, you know, in the absence of regulation, in the absence of legislation, that, you know, with some prodding from the consumer advocates and the FTC, that the industry has stepped up to the plate to try to create a program that, you know, I think with an education program, you will, will you know, help consumers, you know, manage their privacy in, a, in an easy, easy way. And is this the end of the discussion? I think this is the beginning of the discussion. As, as the panel pointed out, you know, with the Department of Commerce and the administration kind of pushing a stakeholder process, we'll have to see how that develops. And I'm sure we'll have more of these sorts of panels in the future. So thank you all for coming. Thank you, Frank. And thank you, Frank.